Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Employers are reducing the number of hours their part-time employees can work to avoid the insurance requirement under the Affordable Care Act. The annual impact on us would be 10 to 12 million dollars with a total statewide health care bill today of 25 million. The head of Ivy Tech heads to Washington to try and persuade lawmakers to raise the full-time hour bar. Logging in state forests has increased 1,000 percent in the past decade, and now it's happening in the backcountry wilderness areas. The first perception is you're raped and pillaged these forests, and that's not the case at all. Good forest management or the destruction of a public asset. Plus, we go live to the State House for an update on the debate surrounding the proposed constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage. Those stories and a look at this week's headlines right now on Indiana News Desk. Hello, I'm Joe Wren and welcome to this week's Indiana News Desk. Ivy Tech Community College President Tom Schneider testified before Congress this week on the effect of the Affordable Care Act's employer mandate is having on their employees. Like most community colleges, our funding does not provide for any large unfunded mandate such as the ACA 30R rule. The annual impact on us would be 10 to 12 million dollars with a total statewide health care bill today of 25 million, so a 50 percent increase. Ivy Tech, like many other businesses and schools across the country, is cutting part-time hours to avoid paying health care benefits. Josh and Lynn has more. Heather Turner spends her days as an instructional assistant at Edgewood High School, keeping her special education students on task and helping them complete their work. But her days recently got shorter. Instead of working 30 hours, she's now here just for 29 and a half hours a week. We're in the middle of something and, and I'm helping the teacher with the classroom and I have to leave in the middle of it. You know, that leaves it all to them and whatever I was doing is just kind of thrown up in the air. It's not just Turner. All part-time positions in the Richland Bean Blossom School Corporation have been cut to 29 and a half hours. Why 29 and a half? Because going up by just half an hour means those jobs would meet the Affordable Care Act's definition of a full-time job. Under what's being called the employer's mandate, employers have to provide health care benefits to full-time employees. It's a, it's a sad thing that, that we have to uh, limit uh, good people. Um, on, on those things, but like I said, being a public institution, we have a set budget and we have to live within that, so that's good, bad, right, or wrong, that's, uh, that's where it ends up. Opponents of the ACA say what's happening at Richland Bean Blossom illustrates a problem many businesses are facing. They say the 30-hour rule incentivizes employers to cut part-time hours to avoid paying health care benefits. However, healthcare law professor David Orentlicker says that's not quite as widespread as reports might make it seem. What we've seen so far is there have been anecdotes. People have said, you know, my employer dropped me to 29 hours, or I got a new job, but they would only give me 29 hours. So clearly that is happening. But when you look over the whole economy, so far we are not seeing a major effect. We're not seeing a big shift from full-time workers to part-time workers. We're not seeing a slowdown in hiring yet. Last summer, 9th District Representative Todd Young introduced a bill in the House, and Senator Joe Donnelly introduced a similar bill in the Senate that would raise the 30-hour cap to 40 hours. In a statement, Donnelly said that most Hoosiers think 40 hours, not 30, is full-time. We need to change the definition of a full-time employee in the Affordable Care Act to bring it in line with what most Americans have traditionally recognized as full-time. 
Orant Liquor cautions that raising the cap could create more problems. He says employers might cut 40 hour a week full time employees back to 39 hours, making them part time and saving the company on insurance benefits. You want to minimize the gaming opportunities. So changing the number of hours, um, people are still going to look for ways to work around that, and it, it's not the, the ideal solution. Schools and universities in particular find themselves in a difficult squeeze. While corporations have a profit margin, educational institutions have fixed budgets and less flexibility to absorb increased costs. Wilcox says that raising the cap to 40 hours would relieve some of the pressure. That makes our building level principals and secretaries jobs a lot easier who schedule those things on a day-to-day -day basis and, uh, and ultimately it makes uh, uh, my job and the board of trustees uh, a little bit easier that we don't have to to sit down with those folks and, and give them news that their their hours are have been cut or are going to remain cut, uh, whatever the case may be. Now for headlines, we go over to Alex Dierkman who has a look at this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Indiana is taking additional steps to ease the propane shortage as Hoosiers brace for another round of sub-zero temperatures. The state is extending a measure which exempts tanker drivers hauling propane from hours of service regulations. The state is also putting more money into a fund to help low-income Hoosiers pay for the higher energy costs. A family of four that makes up to $35,000 will be eligible to receive around an extra $150 this year. Governor Mike Pence is requesting federal low-interest disaster loans for counties impacted by severe storms in November. The loans will be based on the damage sustained in Davies, Fountain, and Howard counties. If approved, U.S. Small Business Administration's disaster loans would be made available for residents, businesses, and nonprofits in those three counties, as well as the counties surrounding them. FEMA de denied Indiana's request for assistance earlier this month, forcing the state to look into other options. President Obama this week announced plans to raise the minimum wage for federal contractors. In the coming weeks, I will issue an executive order requiring federal contractors to pay their federally funded employees a fair wage of at least $10.10 .10 an hour because if you cook our troops' meals or wash their dishes, you should not have to live in poverty. The rate increase will only affect a few hundred workers in Indiana because most defense contractors pay well above the minimum wage. The real impact of Obama's plan could be felt long term, though. Some economists are predicting the plan could be a test run for raising the rate for low wage workers across the board. More Indiana students are reading proficiently in the fourth grade, but the gap between higher and lower income students is growing. Here's how the numbers break down. One IU professor who studies education policy says 70 percent of the performance gap between high and low income students can be explained by children's social backgrounds. So helping families who are helping the students whose families are finan in financial need can be very beneficial. For the first time in more than five years, Indiana's unemployment rate is below 7 percent. The current 6.9 percent unemployment rate represents a substantial decline from 7.3 percent in November and a major drop from the state's peak unemployment rate of more than 10.5 percent in 2009. State officials say Indiana has added more jobs in the last three months than any other state in the Midwest. Crews are clearing trees this week along State Road 37 in preparation for I-69 construction. It's the next step to upgrading the existing four-lane road between Bloomington and Martinsville to interstate standards. NDOT plans to finish the clearing by the end of March so it doesn't disturb Indiana bats that are roosting in the trees. And if you can believe it, the sub-zero temperatures could yield positive results. The deep freeze could help slow down the emerald ash borer as it tries to invade the state's ash trees. It's the coldest it's been in recent years, and it seems the frigid temperatures are hard on things other than just people. The invasive emerald ash borer is present across the state. It eventually kills ash trees, but the pests stand a lesser chance of survival and prolonged spells of sub-zero temperatures. It won't be the end of the emerald ash borer. It'll be the end of a few emerald ash borer. Temperatures would need to be somewhere around 25 to 30 degrees below zero over three or more days to really have a big impact on the borer. We've never had that kind of weather in Indiana. The National Weather Service says those kinds of temperatures would shatter records. The longest cold spell that we've had here is December 89 when the temperature was 66 
hours of zero or below. Scheip says the lowest reported temperatures experienced in Indiana this month were in Zionsville, where it hit negative 20, but that only lasted for a few hours. And Joe, just a couple other interesting benefits of the cold. It could mean that we have fewer mosquitoes and ticks in the summer. That's interesting. I, I don't think you'll hear many complaints about that. <laughs> Hopefully not. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Logging is creeping into areas some say are designated as wilderness land. Will legislation limit the removal of trees in Indiana's state forests? Which Indiana school districts have the most at stake as state lawmakers debate cutting attacks on business equipment? Our education team maps the impact. Those stories and an update from the State House on Indiana's marriage amendment right here on Indiana News Desk. 10,000. 15? 15, you think? 20. 21,000? 600. 20. 18, five. 24. It's at least 40. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. 4,500,000. 650. 20. 650. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No. I knew it. It's just a blanket. Laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. PBS kicks off the weekend with Charlie Rose and America's top newsmakers on his new series, Charlie Rose, The Week. Some people say, well, you know, Obama was this raving liberal before. Now he's you know, Dick Cheney. Recap the week's biggest stories and Charlie's best interviews. You feel there's this incredible synergy between the audience and, and the performer, and time slows down. And get a look at the week ahead. Charlie Rose, The Week. Check local listings. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. Debate over the gay marriage amendment continues to dominate the legislative session. Just to catch us all up, last week the House Elections Committee, chaired by Representative Milo Smith, passed the HJR3 amendment. This week, Smith's gay son, Chris, said he was terribly disappointed. I love my dad and I know he loves me, but this has kind of come to made me come to the conclusion that he, he doesn't see me, see me as an equal, and that really hurts. The Senate will now take up the amendment. Our State House reporter Brandon Smith joins us now. Brandon has been following this through every twist and turn. Brandon, what happens now that this amendment has been passed along to the Senate? Well, the Senate will take it up in committee. Uh, that was uh, news we got this week is that last week, Senator David Long, uh, the Senate President Pro Tem, announced he would move it to the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is where it had been in the past. But he changed course this week and put it instead in the Senate Rules Committee, which is made up of the leadership teams of both uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, a lot more committee chairs. He felt it was the appropriate place. Uh, so it will get heard in that committee uh, in a couple weeks. And Long's hope is that it moves to the floor without any changes, and then we'll see what happens after it moves to the Senate floor. Brandon, I think some of the confusion lies on whether this amendment will be on the ballot uh, this coming fall. What would have to happen for it to appear in November? The second sentence would have to be reinserted and then passed by both the Senate and the House. Uh, there's a real possibility the Senate will try and do that. I would almost that a lot of money it will try, whether or not it succeeds is another matter. But if the Senate does get the second sentence put in, the House would have to agree to that. And there's a lot of question as to whether they can get enough Republicans to vote for HJR 3 with that second sentence. That's the only way it will get to the voters this fall. There have been some comparison, the comparisons made with the right to work back in 2012 debate in the legislation, uh, but that never made it to voters. What's the difference between these two issues? Well, Democrats have kind of complained about this, that a lot of the argument we've heard surrounding HJR 3 this year from Republicans is that we want to let the people have a say, we want to let them have a voice, we want them to weigh in on the, the marriage question. And Democrats say, well, here are a bunch of other huge issues, including right to work, that we asked you to put to a public referendum, and you refuse to do it. The difference here, though, is that it's not like Republicans have a choice. The way the constitutional amendment process works in this state is that it has to go to the voters to be put in the Constitution. Brennan, this has taken a lot of time in the legislation of, uh, this spring, uh, though there's been some other key legislation that's been moving along. We have about 30 seconds. Can you fill us in? 
Sure. Both the House and Senate passed their versions of business personal property tax reform. They'll now have to figure out how to make those two mesh. We've also uh, had the House pass uh, criminal code reform that's following up on the work that was done last year. And we'll see a lot of other bills, including moped legislation, uh, drug testing of welfare recipients, all sorts of things. Okay. Thank you very much, Brandon, for that update. Logging in Indiana's state forest generates more than $2.5 million each year. The practice isn't new, but the increase is worth noting. In the past decade, logging in these state forests has increased 1,000 percent. But during this time, one part of the forest has, among many people, generally been considered off-limits. It's the back country, an area that was designated as a place for a wilderness experience. But now there's logging going on there, and legislation a state representative is proposing that would stop it likely won't go anywhere this session. Sarah Whitmire has the story. Terry Usry says his property is a lot like an island. He's surrounded on all sides by the Morgan Monroe State Forest. We're outdoorsy people. I'm out every single day out in the forest, hiking, walking, walking my dogs. Usry thinks the state has an obligation to preserve the forest. State officials agree, but they have different ideas about exactly how to do that. And we look at all of the attributes that the forest provides, recreation, wildlife, environmental services. We manage with that concept in mind that we're going to provide the, the most biological diversity as we can. So. To get that, if you let the forest all age at the same time to be what some people might consider old growth, you won't have that diversity. In its strategic plan, the DNR's Division of Forestry lists as its number one goal the protection of all forest resources. Seifert says cutting timber helps species distribution and tree overcrowding. Here at the Morgan Monroe State Forest, Seifert and his team are researching the effects of forest management on tree regeneration and forest sustainability. This area has been cut, and now Seifert is watching how it grows back. On our forest here, we're actually going in and planting now. Instead of letting nature take its place, we're actually going in and, and planting after we harvest a site like this. And we'll go in and plant the oak species, and then come in and do a little weed control, well, we, our goal is to close the canopy quickly so that all this other regeneration that would be competitor starts to die out from lack of sunlight. The state's current logging policies trace their roots back to 2004, when then-Governor Mitch Daniels pushed for more public agencies to fund their own budgets, including the DNR's Division of Forestry. I think at its heart it's an economic-driven uh, management style in that um, when Governor Daniels took office, he switched the management strategy of the Department of Natural Resources Division of Forestry to, they, uh, to the, the position that they needed to bring in enough revenue to pay for their organization's function. So it's much more of a business model now. Over the last decade, logging in state forests has increased 1,000 percent, from less than 1.5 million board feet to more than 14 million board feet in 2013. Seifert maintains that in a vast majority of the cases, the state conducts single tree selection, or cutting a tree here and a tree there. We're only harvesting about 60 percent of what we're growing, so if you think about that, we're still accumulating, we're still growing bigger trees, we have really good inventory data that supports what we're doing. But what I think people find particularly upsetting is it seems to know no boundaries. This is the back country of the Yellowwood State Forest. It extends into the Morgan Monroe State Forest, and it's different than the rest of the forest. In 1981, the DNR, at then Governor Robert Orr's request, established the back country as an area where people could enjoy a rugged, primitive experience. There are a number of restrictions, such as you can only access the area by foot, there are no roads, and you can't have horses. According to a DNR publication from 1981, users of these areas must exercise a great deal of caution to not disturb the natural habitat. They're going to be a place for solitude and repose for the wilderness seeker to find the, what they can't find elsewhere, a forest that existed as they did 150 years ago. Although it wasn't prohibited by law, the area was never logged. Now we have um, clear cutting and, and uh, logging occurring in, in what was considered the most kind of important part of the forest. 
Two years ago, loggers came in and cut about 100 acres at the southern end of the back country. It was unprecedented, and it's happening again now at the northern end. That despite continued protests. Now they're taking 101 acres on the north end of the backcountry area and they're going to cut down 1,100 trees in that. And they're saying, oh, that'll have no effect. You won't notice it. Go hiking in the, the, the southern end of the backcountry area where they did the sale last year. There's, there's stumps all over the place. Skidder trails, a 40-foot wide uh, gravel road across the ridge, a log landing area that you can turn a semi around in. You don't notice that when you're hiking in the woods? Of course you notice it. According to the Forest Alliance, the state is getting less money for timber than private owners. Their data shows that in most cases, timber buyers pay about half of what they would for the same quality wood from private woodland owners. This backcountry plot went for a little more than $50,000. In reality, you have heavy machinery going in to do the logging, you're clear cutting sections of the forest. And, uh, and that can create the potential for soil erosion and a lot of other impacts on the environment, let alone you know, removing the trees from the, from the forest. As he enjoys his walks through the forest, Usri says he's confronted by the logging operations, whether it's a newly marked section of spray painted trees, leftover fragments of tree tops, or the trail marks crushed into the soil from the logging equipment. It's always a little bit depressing to me to see, oh, there's the new, new section that's been marked and uh, all these trees I know are gonna be gone a year from now and uh, the forest is gonna be all torn up. Sarah Whitmire joins us now for more. Sarah, protection groups would like the same protections uh, awarded for the backcountry, but it's different from the federal. Uh, areas. What's the right. difference? Well, you hear they kept saying this wilderness area, but mm -hmm. the federal government, Congress, defines what a federal wilderness area is, and they make sure it's protected. With backcountry areas, it's really the state that defines a backcountry area, and they don't have those sort of same statutory protections like against Com, um, commercial enterprises or motorized vehicles. And we, when we did talk to the state's um, director of the Division of Forestry, he did say there was never any intention to completely forbid logging in the back country. Now, I have this article here from a DNR publication. I think it's from the early 80s when that back country was established. It does say that timber harvesting in the backcountry area will be restricted to single tree selection of mature, damaged, or diseased trees. Yeah, the backcountry is all about providing that wilderness experience. They say when you go there, you're supposed to experience the outdoors like it was 150 years ago. So then the real question is, can you enjoy that experience if, for instance, now in the northern part, can you enjoy that primitive experience if 1,200 trees are being cut down in that area. Uh, will Representative Pierce's bill going to get a hearing this year, this session? It seems unlikely. The, I spoke to the Forest Alliance and they said the Division of Forestry was blocking the legislation. Mm, very interesting. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for the story. You. Nearly 20,000 students received state dollars to cover private school tuition. And numbers state officials released this week show a third of students receiving private school vouchers have never attended an Indiana public school. State Impact Education reporter Kyle Stokes is here with more on the numbers. Kyle, this program is really growing fast. It really is, Joe. The voucher enrollment nearly tripled this year, and that's by design. Originally, state law required a student to attend a public school for at least a year before receiving a voucher. Well, lawmakers loosened the eligibility guidelines last year to make more students eligible for vouchers without having to attend a public school first. So if you take a look at the dark green bars on this chart here, you see they step down to this year two-thirds. Fewer than two-thirds of this year's voucher recipients actually attended public schools last year. One other takeaway from a big report the state released this week, most students enrolled in an A or B rated private school, but the D and F rated voucher schools enrolled on average twice as many children per school as the A rated private schools. A panel of state lawmakers wants to close the book on the Common Core standards as well. We've been following that story. The Senate Education Committee approved a bill this week that would stop Indiana from returning to the Common Core at the end of a review of the standards that continues as we speak. The Common Core has caused controversy across the nation, mostly fueled by opposition from Tea Party aligned groups. Indiana was one of the earliest states to 
to adopt the standards, but in his State of the State address two weeks ago, Governor Mike Pence hinted that he favored a move away from the Common Core. Members of both the Indiana House and Senate passed separate and different proposals this week to cut the state's tax on business equipment. State figures show a complete elimination of the business personal property tax would cost school districts a total of $150 million in property tax revenues. And property tax revenues are already down for school districts by $245 million statewide. If you take a look at this map, it shows which school districts could lose the most. The darker the color, the deeper the loss. And I think the most striking thing about the map is if you look at rural areas of the state where the property tax losses have not been quite as bad as in some of the suburban and urban areas, they'd all of a sudden see huge spikes in their property tax losses if this tax were to be eliminated. Take a look at Bartholomew County, Vigo County would see spikes. The Sullivan Schools, Southwest School Corporation would see its property tax losses increase sixfold. But it's important to note that this map shows what happens if the tax goes away entirely. That's not exactly what state lawmakers are proposing. Joe, the House's plan would allow counties to decide to cut the tax. The Senate's plan would allow it to phase out just for small businesses. And that's where the burden, business advocates say, is, is the highest. And as we heard from Brandon earlier, it's one of the key legislative items that will be up for a lot of debate. And no, tell, no telling where it's going to go here in the next month of the session here. Exactly. Thank you very much, Kyle. No problem. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news in southern Indiana throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Hoosier Energy, providing electricity to southern and central Indiana electric cooperatives and their member customers. Information at HEPN.com. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. And by WTIU members. Thank you.